Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. I'm Nick Miles, and in the early hours of Tuesday, the 5th of December, these are our main stories. A cautious response from Washington to Israel's latest military action in southern Gaza. The secretary was very clear about how we want to judge this based on results, not based on intent. I will say we've seen a much more targeted request for evacuations here, so that is an improvement on what's happened before. We get the latest on the COP28 climate talks in Dubai, where the event's president is back on the defensive. And should one of the families at the centre of America's opioid crisis be shielded from future lawsuits? Also in this podcast. Sweden is one of the hotspots for gun violence in Europe at the moment. And what we're seeing now is that various types of homemade explosives are being used. We have a special report on the rise of gang violence in Sweden. And twice the size of London and heading away from Antarctica, the massive iceberg on the loose. The US State Department has given a cautious welcome to Israel's new initiative to warn civilians in Gaza of impending attacks. It said it was too soon to say whether Israeli forces were fully heeding American advice to protect civilians caught up in its renewed offensive against Hamas. But it did say that the Israelis seemed to be making more targeted requests for civilians to flee Israeli targets in the south of the Gaza Strip. Matthew Miller is a State Department spokesman. It's too early to make a definitive assessment. I will say that in the first few days of this military campaign against the South, we have seen some things that don't look like the operation as it was conducted in the North. For example, in the North, at the commencement of operations, you saw them ask or order more than a million people to move. We've seen a much more targeted request for evacuations here. So that is an improvement on what's happened before. Israel has reiterated that it's doing everything possible to minimise civilian casualties. This is the leader of the opposition Labour Party, Merav Mikhaili, talking to the BBC about how the Israeli Defence Forces, the IDF, is waging its offensive. We are very meticulous in working according to humanitarian international law. And we are really doing our best to warn the population and to work as carefully as we possibly can in such a crowded area, which is being abused by Hamas to establish its terror base within this population. We cannot accept living with this threat on our border. Well, Israel has now issued a map of Gaza that identifies which places are not safe. On Monday, it showed six northern and central areas of Khan Yunus, where it said an estimated 167,000 people needed to leave. So how is the new approach going down with civilians on the receiving end? Mohammed Galayini from the English city of Manchester had travelled to Gaza to visit his family. He's now trapped in Khan Yunus. I'm in block 103 of Israel's supposed map of designated safe and unsafe areas. For the past 15 minutes, there's been a succession of massive bombardments ranging from 500 metres away to a kilometre or two. And, And each time the block shakes, it shakes as in in an earthquake and I've been in earthquakes. There was another one just now. Our block, as far as I was aware, this morning is not on the list. I left my home in Gaza City on the 7th of October. I've been in five places since then. Two of those places are damaged beyond repair, so certain death if I'd stayed there. We have nowhere left to go. I have 40 people staying with me at my late grandparents' house in Khan Yunis. Mohammed Galayini there. Well, Paul Adams is our correspondent in Jerusalem. How important is it for Israel to keep its main backer, the US, on side? I mean, it's important, obviously, first of all, to try and do precisely that, to minimise the number of civilians you kill. And as you've been hearing already, people are not entirely sure where they should go to when they receive these orders to leave those areas designated as danger areas. And as you also heard, people have been told to move so many times now that they are just exhausted. But it's also important for Israel to be seen by its principal ally, the United States, to be heeding its advice. Because if and when the United States becomes tired of this campaign, that will be the moment at which Israel is asked to rein itself in. And given the fact that they still have significant 
tasks ahead of them. They want free reign to continue to be able to operate throughout the Gaza Strip for probably months to come. So they know they do have to heed American advice. And at the moment, as you've just been hearing from the State Department, the jury is slightly out as to whether they are. Paul Adams in Jerusalem. The president of the UN Climate Conference in the United Arab Emirates has dismissed reports that he said there was no science proving the need to phase out fossil fuels. In our recent Global News podcast, we reported on reaction to the video published by the Guardian newspaper here in the UK of Sultan An Jabbar making the comments at a live online event two weeks ago. Our climate editor, Justin Rowlett, reports on another day of drama in Dubai. Sultan Al Jabbar did not hide his irritation at the way his remarks have been reported. He was asked by the former Irish president, Mary Robinson, whether he was ready to commit to phasing out fossil fuels urgently. Here's what he said. There is no science out there or no scenario out there that says that the phase out of fossil fuel is what's going to achieve 1.5%. That may suggest he was denying key aspects of climate science, but he immediately followed that by saying that he believes phasing out the use of fossil fuels is both inevitable and essential. That is a strong acknowledgement, not just of the science, but of the need to act on it. And it needs to be orderly, fair, just and responsible. And it needs to be well managed. So allow me to say that I am quite surprised at the constant attempt to undermine this message. The dispute seems to be over the question of urgency. At a press conference today, the COP28 president was joined by Jim Ski, the head of the UN science body. He said to keep the temperature rise to 1.5 Celsius by 2050, coal needed to be phased out completely. Oil use by 2050 is reduced by 60% and natural gas use reduced by 45%. Mr Al-Jabbar repeated that COP28 would prove an inflection point in global action on climate change. It is a hint of something sources close to the presidency have told me, that Mr Al-Jabbar believes he is close to getting this summit to agree to a significant strengthening of the language on climate change, a commitment that we need to phase down, possibly even phase out out the use of fossil fuels. Bizarre as it might sound, that would be a world first. Justin Rowlatt with that report. Over the last three decades in the United States, hundreds of thousands of people have died from overdosing on opiates, many of them prescribed to them by their doctors as a painkiller. Oxycontin, made by Purdue Pharma, first hit the market in 1996. And today, the US Supreme Court is hearing arguments on whether to uphold a $6 billion compensation deal for victims. The drug was marketed aggressively. This is an extract from one of their TV ads from the late 1990s. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. I got my life back now. Now I can enjoy every day that I live. I can really enjoy myself. Some of the victims' families were outside the Supreme Court protesting. Jen Treggio lost her son, Christopher. My son was priceless and he was beautiful and you stole him from me with a little pill that you knew would have killed him eventually. And then you have the nerve to blame him, the addict. Hey, Mr. Sackler, tell me, would you give your kids or your grandkids oxycontin? Would you? Well, the compensation agreement was originally approved earlier this year in a New York court, but it's been challenged by the Biden administration because it would also protect members of the Sackler family, who own Purdue, from future opioid-related lawsuits. So what's at stake for everyone involved? A question for our correspondent in Washington, Nomia Iqbal. I think the question at the heart of this, which has split a lot of families, is should the desire to punish the Sacklers, the ex-owners, get in the way of giving money to those people who need it? This is something that's been going on for decades. It has destroyed families. I, I met many of them outside the Supreme Court today. And they want compensation. But then the argument is, do you go after the ex-owners? What do you do? Because this is holding up a lot of that compensation. There's billions that's due to be poured into addiction treatment and other relief efforts. 
And there are about 60,000 individuals affected by Purdue's painkillers who want this deal to go ahead rather than endlessly going after the Sacklers. But then you've got others, like the ones I spoke to outside court, who say, actually, we want both. We want the money, we want to be compensated, but we want this family to be held responsible. They say to me, why do they get to walk away rich and not bankrupt? Is there any sign which way they will rule? The oral arguments were, as you can expect, quite divisive. And I was outside court with some of the family members listening to those arguments being made. And the families were cheering at a lot of points during the the arguments where you had some of the justices, particularly the Liberal justices, asking that question about why the Sacklers still have money. Remember, this is technically a bankruptcy case. We don't know which way it will go, but it is one of those cases It has the ability to set precedent for future cases. And I just want to quote one of the family members that spoke to me outside court, a woman named Alexis. She has given up her career as an engineer to pursue this because she lost her son, who was addicted to OxyContin. She said to me, I can't even find the prescription from 20 years ago, from the doctors that gave her son these drugs, which he then got hooked on. So she doesn't even know how she can get compensation. So this is going to be running on for some time. As I say, it has divided families as well, but we do expect to get that decision at some point next year. Nomia Iqbal there. Does anyone want to host the Commonwealth Games in 2026? Well, the Gold Coast in Australia's eastern state of Queensland has become the latest to pull out after failing to secure government funding to take on what is one of the largest global sporting events. Phil Mercer in Sydney is following the story. The Gold Coast in Queensland said that it was willing to host the Commonwealth Games in 2026 after the southern Australian state of Victoria pulled out in July, citing financial constraints. Victoria saying that the event was costing too much money. So he said uh, the Gold Coast Mayor Tom Tate unilaterally. He said his city was willing to take on the event in three years' time. But he said that he's now pulling the pin because there is no support from the state government in Queensland, also the federal government in Canberra. And Mr Tate is saying that his decision to abandon plans to launch a bid really fails to save Australia's sporting reputation. He believes that that reputation has been tarnished by Victoria's decision to walk away from the Games. The Queensland state government has said previously that it's not interested in hosting the Commonwealth Games, preferring instead to concentrate on the bigger prize of hosting the Olympics in 2032. This is, of course, an event that has had financial problems before. The UK city of Birmingham stepped in to host the Games last year after the South African city of Durban said it couldn't afford to carry on. So there will be many athletes, fans and administrators very disappointed in the Gold Coast's decision. And still, the Commonwealth Games is looking for a home in 2026. Phil Mercer in Sydney. Well, Victoria had stepped up after applications from Kuala Lumpur, Cardiff, Calgary, Edmonton and Adelaide were all withdrawn. To make things worse, there is nowhere in sight for the 2030 Games to go after the only bidder, the Canadian province of Alberta, withdrew. Sir Brendan Foster is a former British athlete and Commonwealth Games champion and was part of the Birmingham 2022 bid team. Since the days of the early Commonwealth Games, sports now organised on a regional basis, you know, African Championships, Asian Championships, European Championships, American Championships, etc. And for the big sports, the Commonwealth Games is past its sell-by date. You don't need it because often the athletes have to cram in an event here because it's the World Championships or... I think it's past its sell-by date. And I said when Birmingham has happened, probably the last Commonwealth Games we ever see. Sir Brendan Foster. Still to come on the Global News Podcast, just what is Riz? So a person can have Riz, but can also Riz someone up. It's your ability to be able to pick up people. So someone that's attractive might have good Riz, but they also might be terrible at talking to women and have no Riz. We hear about the latest word of the year. Dozens of protesters staged a demonstration outside the UN headquarters in New York on Monday, accusing the body of inaction over the rape, abduction and mistreatment of Israelis. The police and other organisations in Israel have been gathering accounts of sexual violence on October the 7th. 
perpetrated by Hamas, Islamic Jihad and possibly other Palestinian groups and individuals who crossed through the border fence that day. Yal Sharer is from the Survivors of Sexual Violent Advocacy Group, which works with female and male victims. What we learn is that there was sexual violence and rape in these communities in the south of Israel, rural villages, these farms. And also we do have reports of sexual violence from the two music festivals during the holiday. We do have now eyewitnesses that the police has interviewed already and first responders, of course. And we do now have a few survivors Not a lot of both genders. So it didn't only happen to women, it happened to men as well. And that's very important to say. There's anger that organisations like UN Women took so long to speak out about alleged atrocities committed by Hamas and other Palestinians against Israelis. Professor Ruth halperin Kadari is an Israeli lawyer and women's rights advocate who spent 12 years as a member of a UN convention on discrimination against women. She's been speaking to Michelle Hussein. You might find some of what she says disturbing. I saw a number of first-hand eyewitness accounts, for example, of one survivor who hid in the bushes and saw a woman next to her being raped by several men. And I will not go into detailing the extreme brutality of mutilation that she also witnessed. I talked to a first responder paramedic who treated a woman who was brought to his ambulance and she was heavily bleeding. Again, I will not describe in what way and exactly her condition, but she lost blood to the degree of life risk situation. And she told him that she had been raped by four men. I saw footage and pictures from numerous locations of bodies whose condition were all exhibiting the same pattern of mutilation and leaving no doubt that rape was performed on these women before they were executed. And this matches the condition of the bodies as described by women who worked at the Shura base, which turned into a morgue. I saw testimonies of numerous first responders describing what they found as they collected the bodies. And this leaves no doubt that such a concentration of cases in a, less than a day, in numerous locations, it could not have been, had there not been a plan, premeditation, to use sexual violence as a weapon of war. As you started to become aware of all of this in the aftermath of of October the 7th, and knowing the UN system as you do, who did you talk to or turn to? A day after October 7, together with colleagues, with Professor Francis Radai of the Hebrew University, we wrote letters to the CEDAW committee, to the CRC committee, to the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, to UN Women, of course, and to numerous other UN entities. And we asked them to recognize that this has taken place and to condemn it, to acknowledge that this was crimes against humanity in the nature of sexual violence against women. Regrettably, until a week ago, none of them actually said the explicit words sexual violence that was performed by Hamas towards Israel. It took them more than seven weeks First, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and then just this Saturday, UN Women finally issued a statement that did recognize sexual violence as part of the Hamas attack and said the explicit words Hamas and called for a vigorous investigation. But this took them much, much too long. Professor Ruth Halperin Kadari speaking to Michelle Hussein. Guyana has accused its South American neighbour Venezuela of trying to start a conflict after a referendum in Venezuela overwhelmingly approved establishing a new state on Guyanese territory, which has vast oil deposits. In a meeting with supporters in Caracas, President Nicolas Maduro welcomed the result of the referendum. Que viva la victoria del pueblo venezolano! Long live the victory of the Venezuelan people. Long live 
the consultative referendum. We have taken the first steps of a new historical stage to fight for what is ours, to recover Guyana Esequiba. La Guayana Esequiba. Guyana's president, Mohamed Irfan Ali, speaking to the BBC on Sunday, said the referendum was a serious cause for concern for his nation. The rhetoric out of Venezuela and the behaving attitude of the president and vice president necessitates serious concerns. And we cannot be caught wanting. As the president of Guyana, we have to take everything the president and the military say very seriously. Guyana says it remains vigilant following the outcome of Sunday's referendum in Venezuela. Dr Christopher Sabatini is a senior fellow for Latin America at Chatham House in London and professor at the London School of Economics. Paul Henley asked him more about the significance of the land in question. It's very important. It represents about two-thirds of Guyana, and it's rich in minerals, and it's rich in oil. In 2015, they discovered oil just off the coast of the Essequibo region. You're looking at 11 billion barrels of recoverable oil. So this is a huge boon to whoever owns it. But Venezuela's had laid claims to this section of Guyana since basically the late 19th century. It was resolved when it was still a colony of Britain at the time. It was resolved that this was the border as it currently is. But Venezuela has always claimed that part of Guyana as its own. How seriously is the result of this poll being taken? It's clearly a threat of a land grab, an annexation. It's done largely for domestic reasons. What Maduro is doing, his popularity is tanking. He's supposed to have elections next year, which, uh, according to polls, he would lose quite handily. So he's wrapping himself in the flag and a very contentious issue always for Venezuela. If you go to Venezuelan schools, for example, or Venezuelan embassies, it includes that Essequibo region in their own official maps. But clearly, this is an effort to reactivate his popularity, mobilize people, as well as marginalize the opposition. But there is a risk here, because while it is for domestic consumption, he's clearly up the stakes. And right now, of course, with 95 percent of the people, and it was low turnout, approving the the idea of creating Essequibo as another state of Venezuela, we're looking at a potential conflict because he's headed down that road and anything can happen now. It's got neighboring countries on alert already. Brazil mobilizing the army on the border. Exactly right. The delegation from Brazil's foreign ministry had traveled to Venezuela to try to discourage them from any sort of potentially alarmist rhetoric or alarmist actions. But they came back and they mobilized the military. Also, Venezuela is building an airstrip on the other side of the Guyanese border, which is causing some people some concern about what could happen. You mentioned that President Maduro was at risk of losing elections next year and that he needs to gain popularity. There is a fear, isn't there, that these elections could not be free and democratic? Oh, very much. The 2018 elections were derided internationally as being completely unfair, out and out stolen. The U.S. has lifted sanctions unilaterally in a hope of trying to encourage the Venezuelan government to engage in a series of steps, including inviting international elections monitors to try to ensure the elections are, if not free and fair, at least competitive and inclusive. But of course, there's a strong disincentive for the government of Maduro to do so, because it will clearly lose. And at the same time, there are more than 200 individual personal sanctions on officials within the government for everything from narcotics trafficking to human rights abuses. So they risk, if they're voted out of office, they risk going to jail. That was Dr Christopher Sabatini. Sweden has long held a reputation as one of the safest and most peaceful places in Europe. But deadly shootings are becoming a growing problem. Just over 50 people have already been killed in gun violence this year in a country with a population of just 10 million people. And there have been more than 140 explosions as gang members increasingly target the homes and businesses of rivals and their families. Maddie Savage reports from Stockholm. I'm on a commuter train heading to an area called Uppland's Brawl in the north of the capital. There's a big nature reserve, and at Brawl Station you're greeted with orange arrows pointing to hiking trails. But a 14-year-old boy was recently found dead in woods here, and there have been bombings targeting villas and apartment blocks. My name is Anna. I have three children. We live here in Bro. And how are you feeling about this trend for brutal violence? It's awful. You hear uh, reports about violence happening every day. You wake up in the morning and you read the newspapers and it's been multiple explosions most days. We've woken up by explosions in the neighbourhood and it's scary. A few years ago, gang violence usually took place in low-income suburbs here in Stockholm and other big cities. But it spread to multiple neighbourhoods and smaller towns, partly because gangs are increasingly targeting rivals' relatives. 
Some of the violence is now organised by criminal networks based abroad and it's carried out by boys in their early teens, often recruited through social media with promises of money and designer clothes. Sweden is one of the hotspots for gun violence in Europe at the moment. Nils Duquet is a firearms researcher based at the Flemish Peace Institute in Brussels. What we're seeing now is that various types of homemade explosives are being used. Sweden, of course, has a mining industry, which also involves a lot of explosive materials where these can actually be acquired from and used to make bombs themselves. Here at Sweden's round waterfront parliament in central Stockholm, a right-wing coalition came into power just over a year ago and blamed the rise in violence on immigration. Government-funded research shows young people born in Sweden to parents from abroad are overrepresented as both suspects and victims. We can now see that uh, outside ship and lack of integration in combination with trade of narcotics and organised crime is creating this very toxic mixture. That is Sweden's foreign minister, Tobias Bilström, speaking to the BBC in September. The new government's been trying to stop the violence with a string of new laws. It recently made it an offence to recruit children to carry out crimes and ministers want to double prison sentences for offences including gun crimes and detonating explosives. My government aims to both see to it that we can crush organised crime and also that we deal with the failed integration and the consequences both in labour market and education systems. They plan to make it harder for immigrants from outside the European Union to get social benefits to try and get more people working and to invest in more projects designed to improve Swedish language skills. I'm in Järva now, a multicultural Stockholm neighbourhood that's experienced a lot of violence over the past few years, although there haven't been any deadly shootings in 2023. Here, there's been a mixed reaction to the government's tough approach. Liban Varsame's son was killed in a shooting in 2020. Police say he wasn't in a gang and wasn't a target. Liban wants much more investment in crime prevention, including extra support for people convicted of low-level crimes like shoplifting, who can struggle to get work afterwards. It's hard for them to sit at home for hours without any income. So they go outside and stand around And then there's a big risk that they'll be recruited really easily. Many of the children in this neighbourhood have parents who've escaped war. Some locals say better mental health services are an important part of the solution, including this teenager who grew up around drugs. I was 11 when I started to get into trouble. 11? Yeah. Kids here, they are really mean to each other. They want someone to hear them speak about their emotions, but they don't know how to speak about their emotions. So what they do instead is that they lash out. Sweden's problem with gang violence is clearly a complex one. And aside from the pain it's causing affected communities, there are also worries about how it's affecting the country's global image, how that could impact the economy, and whether the gang wars here will spread to other parts of Scandinavia. And you can hear more about Sweden's struggle with guns in Maddy's documentary, Sweden Living with Guns and Gangs, on the BBC World Service and BBC Sounds. It's known as 